and representation theory. So this is a course I taught at Penn uh, a year ago. I follow those no notes loosely, but I will add things uh, to that as we go along. So if you download it now, every once in a while, download the new version, because whatever I add in this course, I'll then put in the notes. Um, the notes also has a, a long list of uh, books uh, that one can use uh, uh, in studying these subjects. In fact, there are many books. So remember, there are three topics in the course. So part one will be deep groups. I expect this will be about six weeks. So part two will be representation theory. Of D groups, of course. That's probably another six weeks. And then the third part is symmetric spaces. Probably about four weeks. So I think six, 12, 16, 16 weeks. That's all right, I think so. Right? We'll see how, how, how quickly we go. So we may, if we add top, topics here, this may take a little bit longer. If you'd like to see particular topics that you want me to add, just let me know and maybe uh, might, we can do that. As far as prerequisites are concerned, uh, um, you don't, there's no remaining geometry required. Uh, although you might think because of part three. Certainly part one and two, uh, no geometry. Uh, one has to know what a manifold is, what vector fields are, what Lie brackets are. So these would be the requirements in these uh, first two parts. So I assume everyone is familiar with those concepts. In the last part, there'll be a little bit of geometry. If people don't know uh, that much geometry, I can review a few things as we go into that last topic. One can also do this completely algebraically without doing any geometry whatsoever. So uh, um, even in that context, one doesn't need it. OK, so uh, what I want to do today, um, sometimes I talk too fast, slow me down, ask me to repeat. In my handwriting, sometimes it's hard to read. So ask me if you can't read it. Today, I will just uh, <clears throat> talk about the content of the whole course. So I'm not really starting yet the, the course. I'll start it early on Wednesday. Just what kind of things will we do this semester? What are some typical results? Uh, and you kind of get an overview of the kind of things uh, we'll discuss. So first, what's illegal? So you may all know this, so I do not buy G, my letters for Lie groups, always G, H, and K. These are typical letters I use for, for Lie groups. Right? So they are uh, finite dimension manifolds. And with manifold implicit, I always assume that these have only uh, countably many components, as is usually done for a manifold. That assumption is actually here important for the Lie groups. And then, of course, then I add to that the condition uh, G is also a group. So I combine these two concepts, manifold and group, which in principle have nothing to do with each other. And this is probably one of the most, most amazing combinations of concepts in mathematics, because it's very deep. This combination is amazingly deep and is important in almost every area in mathematics. And I'll give you some of the amazing properties that one gets if I combine these two properties. Of course, I have to somehow require some kind of compatibility. It's a group, it's a smooth, so what does that, uh, how is that compatible? Well, you assume that uh, multiplication is smooth, so you have two maps, and I multiply, and I have another map where I take the inverse. Let's call that maybe sigma and this i. So sigma and i should be smooth. So multiplication is inverse smooth, that's my compatibility, and that's a Lie group. And that has all kinds of amazing properties. So let me list uh, a couple of them. A few we will prove, but I won't prove all of them, because they're not that important for understanding and using the theory. 
first one is that uh, if I only assume that sigma and i are c1, so if it's just c1 in that sense, uh, this implies it's infinity. So once multiplication is c1, it's infinity. And in fact, uh, analytic. Multiplication is also analytic automatically. Right? So in the sense that, so the manifold has some analytic atlas, which is no restriction, but every manifold has an analytic atlas, and that atlas multiplication is, uh, is analytic. So C1 implies analytic. Kind of amazing, right? Uh, first instance that shows how powerful the combination is. Even more, than that, even more than that, in some sense, even continuous implies analytic. But let me make that a little bit precise. Um, uh, the following amazing fact is true. So first let me say, what is a topological group? So topological group is a space which has a topology on it, of course, right? Uh, such that uh, the multiplication inverse uh, are only continuous. So in this, con in this generality, I don't assume it's a manifold, right? Just the topological space with multiplication, which are continuous. That's called a topological group. That's a much bigger much more general kind of concepts. And there's a theorem by Montgomery and Zippen. It was around 1952. Like this was <coughs> one of uh, uh, these famous problems by Hilbert that he posed in the beginning of the last century. It's called Hilbert's fifth problem. You know with these, uh, the list of Hilbert's problems? They're quite amazing. Look at Wikipedia. They give you the list of all the 20 problems. What half of them were solved. So there was an international congress in the beginning of the last century, in fact, around 1900 more exactly. And Hilbert gave a talk there in which he posed what he thought were the most important problems in mathematics at the time. And these problems were all studied over the century, and about half of them were solved. So, and this uh, problem here, some of them some of the problems are, have a vague formulation and you have to interpret them. So in this problem here, Hilbert wants to understand uh, in what sense, uh, what's the difference between a topological group and a Lie group? When is a topological group a Lie group? And the theorem says that uh, if G is a topological group, and G is uh, locally homeomorphic, to Rn, this implies G is a Lie group. Of course, some requirement like this uh, is certainly necessary. And of course, the manifold is locally homomorphic to Rn. So that additional assumption is not so, uh, not so strong. Of course, this also says that my topological group is finite dimensional. Uh, these topological groups here, they are, can be infinite dimensional. They can be very wild. So here I'm assuming some kind of uh, finite dimensionality, and then it's Lie group. So continuous implies C1, implies analytic. Right. Kind of amazing, amazing theorem. So, uh, this was a big thing in the 1950s that he thought he proved this. It's also true under somewhat weaker assumptions, but this is maybe in the context here, easy one to formulate. By the way, things of this type here, so a space that's uh, uh, local homomorphic or any called a topological manifold. So the whole theory of topological manifolds, similar to differential manifolds, uh, and uh, for Lie groups there's no difference. In general, there are topological manifolds which are not manifolds. It's a more general concept. Anyway, so here's another example. Uh, it's an amazing combination, com combination of, of uh, uh, concepts, manifolds, plus a legal, and has uh, surprising properties. I'm going to list a number of surprising properties as I go along. Um, okay, the next uh, important concept is uh, what's a subgroup? So, of course, we're going to call the Lie subgroup to distinguish between subgroup. So, certainly, since these are groups, it's clear what a subgroup is in the group sense, right? 
when, I, when do I call such a subgroup, a least subgroup in the least sense? So uh, kind of the obvious uh, requirements, certainly, so it's a subgroup in the group sense. Uh, and it should be some kind of sub-manifold, the G and H are manifolds. Uh, and here the somewhat uh, subtle issues that we have discussed at some point, the sub-manifold is only immersed. It doesn't have to be embedded. There are good reasons for that. Um, okay, so sub-manifold and a subgroup, that's called a, a least subgroup. Okay, here's another amazing theorem. Uh, GLD group. And uh, H containing G, a subgroup, which is closed. This implies uh, H is a least subgroup. So why is this uh, result amazing? So you should read this carefully. I'm assuming G is a legal group. I'm not assuming H is a legal group. I'm just assume, assuming that as algebraically it's a subgroup in the group sense. Then it's a, H must be a manifold. So I have to construct a manifold structure on H and then show that multiplication is, uh, is smooth, which is not so hard, but I have to show that there's a manifold. And for this to be true, I need some condition like that the group is closed. So again, an amazing property, right? A group, a subgroup becomes a manifold. Amazing. This is very useful. The proof is somewhat technical. I might indicate at some point, but we we'll use this all the time. Uh, we'll see in a minute uh, uh, how. <coughs> In fact, maybe, maybe at this point, then uh, let's see how it gets used in, by giving some examples. So, simplest examples are what are called matrix groups. But in some sense, that's what, what every legal group looks like. Uh, so, say GLNR. The simplest example, so and and matrices, which the term is non-zero, invertible matrices. Uh, that's clearly an open subset inside R n squared. So it's a manifold. Multiplication is polynomial, inverse is rational, really smooth. Right? So for very simple reasons, that's a that's a new group. And then I can define subgroups, for example, S R N R. So that equal to one. That's, of course, a subgroup in here in the algebraic sense, right? And uh, if I define things by equations, it's always closed, right? So I can use this result here. It's a subgroup. It's closed. It must be legal. Uh, that's, uh, say, the... Of course, you can also do it directly. It might be a good exercise in a few cases to show it directly, but that becomes very cumbersome because I can now do, say, other examples which are where you have to work harder. Orthogonal matrices. That's again a nice example of a league of unitary matrices. Of course, this sits inside GLNC, right? Inside the n by n complex in virtual matrices. Okay. Um, other typical examples. upper triangular matrices. So in one form, I assume there are ones along the diagonal, anything above. In another form, I assume anything along the diagonal, everything else below zero, and everything else above arbitrary. So this is what is uh, typical, what's, what's called a Neil Potent legal. And this is typically what's called a solver legal. Uh, and these two examples here, uh, ON and UN, these are compact groups. And that's certainly the, say, the three most important ca categories among uh, B groups, uh, new potent, solvable, and compact. These are classified. I'll come back to that in a minute. These are well understood in a certain way. And uh, these are not classifiable. They're too complicated. These are very complicated objects in general. But I'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, so these 
are examples. And as you see, this, this fact here is very useful, so I don't have to prove something as a manifold. What's the next group concept? The homomorphism, right? What's the analog among Lie groups? This is a Lie group homomorphism. If uh, it's a group homomorphism, certainly, plus it's smooth. So it just requires smoothness. Add this as your compatibility condition between group and being a manifold. Here, of course, I assume H and G are the groups. Right? Amazing fact, phi, uh, if phi is C0, this implies that uh, phi is analytic. So again, continuous implies analytic. Kind of amazing. Um, uh, so that's the concept of legal polymorphism. I'll say a few more words about that later on. Um, just so, so many of the of the things that you know from algebra about groups and homomorphism of groups all have analogs in the context of Lie groups. For example, if I have such a homomorphism, uh, then uh, the kernel of phi contains an H, and the image of phi contains in G are Lie subgroups. First one is clear, because it's close. Kernel is here certainly defined by equations. It's a subgroup, it's close, it's a Lie group. Image of phi is not so obvious. In fact, it's not necessarily closed. So you can't use that result. In fact, this is a good example here that if I want this to be always true, and it should be true, of course, right? Then I have to define a Lie, group, a Lie subgroup as being immersed. This is in general only immersed but not embedded. So it's very important for the whole general theory to assume Lie subgroups are only immersed. Then, for example, the usual thing, right? So, H divided by kernel uh, phi is isomorphic to the image of phi as Lie groups. So, all the usual things are algebraic analogs in, in Lie groups. Uh, in the strongest possible sense. Everything is true in the strongest possible sense. Which yeah. is so wonderful about, about Lie groups. Um, okay, last concept I just want to mention. Very important is that of Lie algebra. Uh, so first, uh, abstractly, what's a Lie algebra? Right, Lie algebra is a bilinear form on a vector space. such that it satisfies also the Jacobi identity. So, x, y, z, and cyclic commute. x, y, z, plus x. This here, x, y, z, is that what I forgot? equals zero. X, y, z, x, y, z. Okay. Sigma notation. That's called the code identity and the vector space of structure is called a Lie algebra. Right. And uh, the wonderful thing is that to every Lie group I can associate the natural way a Lie algebra, which I can think of as a tangent space of this manifold at identity. This becomes a Lie algebra. Um, I don't want to define it right now. We're going to do that uh, probably on Wednesday. Um, and that's certainly that's an important uh, step to go from the Lie algebra to a vector space with a certain algebraic structure. That's a, more, that's a very important step. Maybe as an example, let me just give you an example. If I take GLNR, um, then the Lie algebra structure is just a commutator. That's the simplest kind of Lie algebra structure on a vector space, the vector space of all matrices, the commutator. Right? And of course, all the examples for Lie subgroups of this 
So the Lia Liebeck it is also still the commutator restricted to the subgroup. So think of it as commutators. Um, amazing facts again. Uh, so maybe first, if uh, G1 and G2 are Lie groups, uh, then uh, um, G1 is isomorphic to G2 if and only if the Lie algebras are isomorphic. And I have to add a word up to covers. So things are often true only up to covers on the legal level. So what do I mean by this? Of course, this here means that I have a diffeomorphism of the manifold, which is an isomorphism of groups. Then I call the two G groups uh, isomorphic as Lie groups. You have a vector space isomorphism which respects the Lie bracket. So if the tangent piece of the entity is the same, then the Lie groups are safe. Amazing, right? Knowing everything at one point, I know the whole group in a certain way. Um, if I want to go back here, so what, what does this mean? If I want to go back here, if I have two Lie groups with the same Lie algebra, I may have to go to a cover of one or the other before they become isomorphic. Okay. Um, or I can assume uh, uh, that they're simply connected. So if this is true, uh, then, it's, uh, then it, this is correct in that formulation. Otherwise, I have to go up to covers. So at, at some point, fairly soon, I have to use some covering space theory. So I, I hope that everyone is familiar with so, so the basics of covering space theory. I want to see what does that look like for Lie groups. In fact, covering space theory for Lie groups is much simpler than general covering space theory. Everything is much simpler. <laughs> uh, so we discussed it at some point, because that's important. Um, so this is an important fact. Another important fact that's not obvious at all. Um, well, do I want to do this already? Uh, yes. Given a Lie algebra, oh, by the way, so I've used this uh, notation already here, so this Lie algebra here, I often denote by the corresponding German script letter. Right, so if G is a Lie group, it's understood that this is the Lie algebra of this Lie group. If I have a Lie group H, it's Lie algebra with script H. If I have a Lie group K, it's Lie algebra with script K. Okay. So in that sense, uh, that's what I mean here, right? I have two Lie groups with the same Lie algebras. This G1 is Lie algebra of capital G1, and so on. So given a Lie algebra, say, V, in the abstract sense, but I find a mention vector space with a Lie bracket on it, then there exists uh, a Lie group, G, with that Lie algebra. So it's where I can go back and forth. That's what this says, right? Here is an easy direction to do a on Wednesday, I go from a Lie group to this kind of Lie algebra, this algebraic structure, Lie algebra, and you can go backwards. Uh, and that's non trivial. Okay. Then, what we also, after we do this kind of basics, uh, uh, which won't take too long, uh, the goal of this first part, I could say, uh, formulate in the following. Uh, fashion, if you want, I want to classify all compact B groups. And the result, I can state the result uh, up to products and covers. They are the following form. So the ones we saw already, so we say connected, right, or connected. So it's some, often I assume a Lie is connected, although not always. They are either S or N. So O N is not connected, determined to be plus or minus one. This here is determined equal to one, that's a connected Lie group. 
Uh, then we saw already the group UN that is connected by itself. Uh, and then there's one more of the similar nature, which is SPN. So here I use quaternions. Right? These are real orthogonal matrices, complex orthogonal if you want to, unitary. And these are quaternic matrices, again with A, A by transpose identity. But now the edges of A can be quaternions. Uh, so that's also illegal. They're all three compact. And then uh, uh, I have a series of what are called exceptional groups. And they're called uh, G2, F4, E6, E7, E8. So four very special, five very special exceptional groups. Uh, these are much more difficult to describe and study. I think at some point I may want to talk about these exceptional groups a little bit. Um, um, well, that's, that's more difficult. That's a complete list. So here are say classical matrix groups if you want to. Here are these five exceptional ones. I can then take products and I can take covers. That's it. Um, well, so, ha, ah, forgetting one, the n tors. So, S1 cross S1. So I can take also products with tori. It's kind of trivial if you want to. So that's a difficult theorem. And we're going to spend a large part in this uh, first part proving that. And the typical thing one does in order to prove things like this is that uh, first one goes from the Lie group to the Lie algebra of the group. And you saw there's a certain kind of one-to-one -one correspondence up to covers. So if I can classify these, I can classify these. So I, I take a Lie algebra, now I have an algebraic object, right? just a vector space, an algebraic object, much simpler. And then as often I complexify. Then I have complex V algebra. But linear algebra over the complex is much simpler than linear algebra of the reals. So when you complexify, understanding these kind of uh, complex V algebras is much simpler. And here one reformulates this uh, compactness condition here into requiring that this algebra is what is called same as simple which means no ideals. This, it's a vector space right, with a deep bracket. And what's an ideal? Right, so H inside G would be an ideal in the sense of deep brackets. Those would mean H is an ideal. Right? And uh, of course, it's the zero dimension vector space is an ideal, that's a trivial one. The whole thing is an ideal, that's a trivial one. There shouldn't be any others. And it's called same or simple. And one can classify the same or simple complex D address. That's what we do. That will take up a large part of part one. But for me, it's always important to always be able to go back. And that's not quite trivial. Once we classify these here, and that's in terms of what are called roots and Lincoln diagrams, so we do this in detail. Uh, that's done in every book on Lie algebras. I then want to understand, how do I go back to the real Lie algebras? And there's some subtle problems involved. Then how do I go back to the, all the possible Lie groups of that Lie algebra? So for me, this, this is the most important object, the Lie group itself. Of course, for many others, this is important concepts because they're algebraic. Right? They're different viewpoints. Right? And of course, I want to always be able to go back eventually, what does it mean about the Lie group? And that's done in very few books. In fact, I don't know any book where it does all of that, uh, going backwards. So I'll discuss that in the course. Um, OK, that's part one, I guess. So part two was representation theory. Go from what until 1.30 to 3, right? Oh, I have lots of time. So, for groups, uh, if you study groups, you probably also study representations of groups, right? It's important way to understand groups is via representations. And uh, now I want to do this for Lie groups. 
so what's the representation of a Lie group? Uh, say, where that phi of the Lie group P is simply homomorphism from G into GLNR. We are called real reps, real representations, or it goes from G into GLNC. So complex reps. Again, as before, complex representations are easier to understand than real representations. Of course, I can go from here to here by simply complexifying. But every real representation defines a complex, complex representation by complexifying. Once I understand these completely here, I can then ask the question, well, what, how, do I, how do I then describe all the real representations once I know all the complex representations? That's a subtle problem. That's, again, not discussed in, in uh, most books. And for me, that's important. Uh, and of course, then, uh, uh, OK, sorry. So that's the representation. You quickly, again, make this into an algebraic question by saying that, well, if I have such a representation, I can look at the derivative of this homomorphism, which is, after all, differentiable at the identity. So this goes from, say, T E G into tangent space at the identity of G L N R. This I call G, right? script G is my D algebra. And uh, here, I, I will then call this analogously script G L N R. So the Lie algebra of the Lie group G L N R. Turns out that this is simply here the set of all n by n matrices. This were after all the invertible ones, so I get all of them. With this Lie bracket, remember the Lie bracket was simply uh, A B. Is equal to AB minus BA. Simplest kind of D algebra, you can imagine. So uh, I then call this D phi, right? I, I dropped the index E. And uh, again, one of the amazing properties is that uh, this derivative identity completely describes a homomorphism in the sense that if you have two homomorphs in phi1, Um, if the derivatives are the same, this implies that the homomorphs themselves are the same. So homomorphs itself is completely described by this uh, linear object, the root identity. And this linear object, object here respects the structure, right? At this level here, it respects multiplication, the group structure. At this level, it should respect the Lie algebra structure. This here is a Lie algebra homomorphism. Um, and that, of course, is now something that's easy to understand again, because it's linear algebra. Right. And this here says that if I understand the linear algebra, I understand the homomorphisms. Uh, and conversely, so uh, given, let me just formulate this, given a d phi, there exists a phi. So you can try to formulate yourself, but right? given, say, two uh, abstract vector spaces, which are Lie algebras, which, uh, with a linear map in between them that respects Lie brackets, then there exists up to covers two corresponding Lie groups uh, and homomorphisms, which with that, with that uh, the algebra homomorphism. Right. So, so I can go back and forth. That's what this says. Right. This is the forward direction. That's easy. And this is the backward direction. So understand one, understand the other. Uh, as usual, going backwards is a little more subtle. At some point, we have, want to understand this. but. Uh, this means that representation theory gets reduced to linear algebra of representations of Lie algebras. And that algebraic objects we have to study. Um, uh, 
and as usual, you, you complexify. Always complexify. Then I need to understand a complex E algebra homomorphisms of uh, complex E algebra. And that's not linear, al linear algebra option of the complex numbers. And this was how I can understand in detail. Um, and here, uh, the goal, if you want to, in some words, is uh, classify all reps of complex groups. So I can understand that completely. But of course, remember, I go from G to the Lie algebra G, and I complexify. I study complex reps of complex D algebras in, in lots of details. This involves what I call weights of the representation and understanding the uh, structure in terms of weights and the drinking diagram of the representation. This is a linear algebra story that's quite involved and most of the time we spend right here. Then one can go back here and back here and that's often subtle. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, one result in this direction. A non-trivial result. Um, given a Lie algebra, G, um, it doesn't have to, doesn't have to come from a Lie group. Just let me just use the same letter. Uh, there exists an N. such that uh, G is a Lie sub-algebra of uh, GLNR. So in other words, our representation from G into GLNR for large N. But it says that every Lie algebra is a matrix Lie algebra. I can view it as a subset of GLNR, which I understand very well, right, GLNR. So every Lie algebra is a matrix algebra. One can then translate it into uh, every, for every Lie group G, is a subgroup of GLNR up to covers. This again comes this word where I have to be a little bit careful. It's only true up to covers. The group G itself may not be a matrix group, but then some cover is. Two for example is uh, if I look at SL2R, that's of course by definition a matrix group. Right? I want to have a topological representation on R2 of this D group. What's a matrix Lie group? But now I can take the universal cover of this, of this Lie group. So at some point we have to prove that if I take a Lie group, the universal cover is again Lie group. That's a natural kind of thing to assume. <laughs> this is not a matrix group. So in other words, no matter how large I choose n here, it can never be viewed as a subgroup of GLNR. And of course, without that, it is. So up to covers, everything is a matrix group. But for the Lie algebra, of course, it's on the dot. And again, this is a non-trivial theorem. Um, in that context, something which we probably want to discuss at some point is uh, uh, what I was called spin representation. So somehow, among the representation of compact groups, the most difficult one to understand are SOM. <coughs> this Lie group has some special representations that are difficult to understand uh, uh, directly, which are called spin representations. So they're a little bit harder to construct than any other kind of representation of a compact Lie group. Uh, and uh, this has to do with Clifford algebras. So 
when once you describe spin representation in general, one should understand Clifford algebras. So at some point in the second part of the, of the course, you may want to spend a little bit of time talking about Clifford algebras and these spin representations, because they're very important. Um, okay. That's part two. And part three, so let me say some words about part three. Symmetric spaces. So these can be defined geometrically and they can be defined algebraically. I'm a geometer, so I'm going to do it geometrically. In fact, many of the theorems about symmetric spaces, if you do it geometrically, are fairly easy. If you do it algebraically, they're fairly hard. Um, so let me first describe what a symmetric space is. So I have a manifold, I have a metric on it. So D is a metric on the manifold M. Uh, and then I say it's a symmetric space uh, if for each point P in the manifold M, there exists an isometry so let's call it S sub P from M to M so it respects the metric it's an isometry of the metric that's given on the manifold such that uh, it fixes the point and the derivative of symmetry at that point is minus identity that's the definition. So for every point, you have a symmetry. Uh, if you know a little bit of geometry, the way one, I mean, you might want to uh, visualize that or view that is as follows. So given my point P, uh, say let uh, gamma be a Jurassic. There's a beginning point P. And what the symmetry does it takes gamma at t uh, into gamma at minus t. So let me draw a picture. Right, so let's take a point P. Let's take a ball around the point P. I look at all the various Jurassic's that go to the point P. I take the point to the opposite point, point along the Jurassic. Kind of like a reflection at the point P along Jurassic's. Okay. But this definition is equivalent to this one here, which is because much easier to, to write down. That's kind of a geometric way of, of visualizing it. Because this map you can always define, but the very strong requirement here is that this map must be, must be an isometry. That makes it into a very strong assumption. Some examples. Right, so certain Rn I can just reflect around every point. That's clearly an isometry, right? I find that. Same way I can do it on SN and A on hyperbolic space. So these, these things naturally have natural reflections that uh, kind of exist uh, that you can uh, find very easily. More subtle examples are something like uh, complex lines, CPN. It's a piece of complex lines inside CN plus 1. On CPN, there's also an analog over the quaternions set of quaternic lines in Hn plus 1. Mm -hmm. Then there's a funny one uh, over the Killy numbers. So again, one of these exceptional examples, uh, which only exists for n equal to 2. These exist for every n, but only exist for n equal to 2. It has to do with the Killy numbers. Right? Killy numbers uh, are more subtle, more complicated <coughs> than complex numbers or quaternions. Uh, what do they not have? the K numbers, they're missing something. It's not associative. That makes things very separate, subtle. Uh, and that in some way, because of that, in some indirect fashion, they only exist uh, for n equal to. Um, so these are see the, because uh, then I can do an, an analog of say, here I have Sn and Hn, I have an analog of Cpn, uh, 
which is called CHN. It's a hyperbolic space, but over the complex numbers, complex hyperbolic space. <laughs> and this is not a very uh, nice notation. <laughs> hyperbolic space over the Victorians. Uh, and then also the analog of this here. So these are actually compact versions, and these are non-compact versions. And I'll say in a minute something about the relationship. Uh, and there are many other examples. I'll describe some of them right now. And uh, I think one of the important, one of the reasons that this uh, theory is so important, in fact, I claim as equally as important as a legal, because many, many examples in mathematics uh, are symmetric spaces. Uh, and one can then use a whole theory, uh, a very deep theory of symmetric spaces, to study these manifolds. Uh, some examples. Uh, uh, the simplest ones are Grassmann manifolds. So let me just think by G, uh, N, uh, K. K is a field, as a field can be the reals, complex numbers of the quaternions. So as usual, all these things work over the reals, complex quaternions. And these are n-dimensional subspaces. Of uh, k to the n, k to the sorry. Have to put another letter in there, right? So. <coughs> of uh, k to the capital n. So n-dimensional subspace of R capital N, for example, that's the reverse manual, right? and then complex subspaces of complex C to the N. That's a complex plus minus. So these plus minus are certainly some of the most basic uh, examples. Then there are various subspaces of this, which are also important. One is called the set of all Lagrangian subspaces. So if you do a symplectic geometry, that's a very important object, just to say, few words, what is it? So I take a vector space of dimension, say, 2n. I take a symplectic form. In other words, something whose top power is non-zero. It's called a symplectic form. And then I say that L contained in V, an n-dimensional subspace contained in V is Lagrangian, if uh, omega on the subspace is dead zero. So this n here is the largest possible dimension where I can do that in a two-n-dimensional vector space. Of course, this must be even. If such an omega exists, the dimension must be even. And then the largest dimension of a subspace where this thing vanishes is n. And now look at the set of all possible Lagrangian subspaces. So. so the set of... Uh, L contained in V2N, that is the function, is a symmetric space. Uh, that's a very important symmetric space in symplectic geometry. And there are others. Maybe, maybe one, one that's simple to describe is, uh, say I choose a vector space V, so let me say it's a set of all inner products on a vector space. So take a vector space, look at inner products on the vector space, look at the set of all possible inner products. That's a space, that's a manifold, and that's a typical example of a symmetric space. There are many others. They often have very geometric descriptions, and uh, especially the non-compact versions. Uh, so these are all non-compact versions here. There's also non-compact. They're often very important in number theory, in many other areas of mathematics. So, so they have a very deep theory. And uh, what we want to do here is, uh, well, so understand all the basic properties of symmetric spaces and then classify. Again, these can be classified. 
although the classification is more difficult than the one of Lie groups. Um, before I say something about that, let me just say there's another uh, wonderful property called duality between non-compact symmetric spaces and compact symmetric spaces. A question? Please ask questions out, out loud if you want to understand something. If everyone else has a question too then. So a typical example is uh, the duality between hyperbolic space uh, and SN. So a certain kind of uh, wonderful duality. Uh, so this, this going back and forth, I multiply with I. Take a tangent space, multiply with I. I can go from compact to non-compact. In what sense do I mean that? Uh, so, for example, here, the whole say, trigonometry of uh, the geometry of SN, like triangles and things like this, is, is described as a sine function. Yeah. That's what encodes the geometry uh, of SN. Multiply by I. So I look at sine IT, and I have to multiply in front of it also, and I get sinh T. Sinh T encodes all the geometry for example, of triangles of a body space. Okay. Now I go from one to the other just by multiplying by i. So in that sense, the geometry of this space and this space are very closely related. Although one is compact, one is non-compact. Okay. And this uh, works for any symmetric space. Uh, there is a dual to this one is this one, these are dual, and there's a dual here, and so on. Often duality, uh, oh, let's see what dual to this one, for example, is not, not so obvious. But there is this wonderful duality. So if I can classify the compact ones, I classify the non-compact ones also. So in the theory, one then concentrates on the compact symmetric spaces, and one shows what they all look like. Again, up to products and covers, so you want to introduce the, understand the building blocks. They are classified, and these are the typical building blocks. There are a couple other ones which are, say, classical geometries, and then just like for Lie groups, there's a series of, of exception ones. Okay. And that one is much longer, the exception ones. But uh, uh, this, this is all known, and that's what we could do in the last part of the course. All of it was, was done by Carton at the beginning of the last century, and it's an amazing sequence of papers. Um, Lie groups uh, came up first uh, um, in trying to understand, so Lee did not know what a manifold was, certainly. This was in uh, the 19th century, 1850s or so, he, he looked at such things. So for him, things were only defined locally, and there are actually different morphism groups. Groups are different morphisms, uh, which describe invariance of differential equations. So you want to understand differential equations. Whenever you have a differential equation, and you can show it's invariant under some operation, some different morphism, that says something deep about the differential equation and you can then use that uh, to prove properties about it. And so he wanted to understand these kind of continuous groups of diffeomorphism that preserve the differential equation. And uh, that's how this whole subject started. Uh, and uh, he then proved local versions of many of the things, uh, or some of the things I mentioned. For example, that this corresponds to Lie group and Lie algebra, he proved locally. To understand Lie algebra, going from Lie to Lie algebra, I just had to look at the identity. So for the group defined locally, it's good enough. And then he showed that given a Lie algebra, there is a local group which has that Lie algebra. I think everything was local. And there was some attempt at a classification, but I had mistakes in it. Uh, um, and uh, the final correct version was done by Carton, in an amazing sequence of papers. And then shortly after that, he also classified these kind of symmetric spaces, uh, another amazing sequence of papers. Um, so this is all done uh, by the 1920s and 1930s, all this was finished. Um, because then more uh, simpler versions of all the proofs were discovered later on, but say the mathematics was done by the 1920s or 30s. Okay, so that's uh, the goal of the course of what I, what I want to cover. Uh, let's see how far we get.
Like I said, if you want me to cover something uh, that you'd like to see for your own purposes and whatever else you're studying, let me know. I can see if I can fit it into the course. Um, and uh, maybe any questions about the prerequisites or uh, any other questions about the contents of the course you want to ask right now? Okay. Something I want to do, I think, uh, so as usual, if you want to learn something, it's very important to do exercises. Right? You can't learn a subject without doing exercises. So I'll assign exercises. The notes that are on, on my homepage do have lots of exercises in them. I'll probably add, add some more as you go along. Um, some of them are, are fairly simple in the sense that if you just look at the definitions and try to use them a little bit, the proof is not hard. And often they are facts that are actually very important for us later on. So something that I would normally call a theorem in a course and I quickly prove it is an exercise. Okay. But it's really simple in the sense that you just sit down, try to do it, and then it's not very hard. And unless you do that, you don't really understand the concepts very well. Uh, so some of those I will assign, and there's some other exercises a little bit harder, which I will assign. And what I would suggest is that at some point we maybe uh, uh, arrange another class, like maybe an hour or so, once a week, where you present solutions to the problems. Uh, so for anyone who wants to learn the subject thoroughly, I think that's necessary. Some of you may just want to get an impression about the subject without necessarily investing all the time on should to learn it thoroughly, which is also fine with me. But if you want to learn, learn the theory, then you should come to these uh, problem sessions and uh, or maybe assign. Uh, well, we'll see how we arrange it. I don't want to discuss it yet. Maybe on Wednesday or next week, we can decide when we do that, in, 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 which, in which form we do that. Uh, but I think it's important to do exercises. You have problems reading my handwriting or understanding me? Please ask questions if you do. Right? OK, I don't think it makes sense for me to start right now, so I'm going to finish a little bit early today. And then I'll start thoroughly on, on Wednesday with Lee Groups and Lee Algebra. So the elementary things about the, I said about Lee, Lee Groups and Lee Algebra, they go fairly quickly. And I'll start with that on Wednesday.